Well, hello there, folks. Welcome to Miyagi Mornings, episode 133, and uh, it's going to be a good one today. I am going to just hang out with you guys for just a few moments to allow people to uh, to come on into the live stream. We've got about a dozen right now. That's good. And uh, before I start, I'll tell you that the, uh, the cool flag back there, if you want one of your own, they're like seven bucks, and the link is in the uh, video notes below. With that, let's get ready to... Uh, Turn on the recording for the podcast and get into this subject. Well, hello, folks. Welcome to Miyagi Mornings, episode 133. And today's uh, episode is called Why I Don't Trust the Authority of Science. And I think that's really important. We hear a lot of people shrieking and screaming, trust the science. You know, this is science. You know, science says the science is settled, all, all different versions of this. Well, those people are a problem, but they're really more a symptom. The bigger problem comes from what is supposed to be science itself, in my opinion. And it is in science. It is in science. I trust the scientific method to be the best logical set of rules that we have to determine the reality behind, behind a situation while ruling out the mystical and supernatural, et cetera, unless that force itself is something that can be measured. So I trust the scientific process, but I do not trust science, the entity, science, the authority. And anyone that perpetrates, perpetuates the idea that science is an entity to be trusted does not understand science at all, even a tiny little bit, you know, I mean, it, it, that's just a reality guys that the entire scientific process, and, and it's actually bigger than this, but just breaking it down to kind of what they teach you in like fifth grade, because we could, we should at least hold our vaulted scientists that are supposed to be authority figures today to the standard that we learn when we're in fifth grade. Now, don't you guys think that's fair that we at least say, you know, like minimum, you guys got to get to like fifth grade scientific understanding of what science is. If you're going to call yourself a scientist, you can go higher. But the basic premise is that we, that we look at a thing that we don't fully understand. We take all the information that we have and then we form a hypothesis. I believe that this is why, or this is the reason, or this is the problem or whatever it is. This is what's going on here. And I base it on these things. That's called a hypothesis. It's an educated guess. And then we create an experiment where we have a controlled group and an experimental group. I know this is really rudimentary, but it's kind of, it seems like people don't understand this anymore. And then we measure the results of those two sides of a thing. And then we draw a conclusion from that and we present our findings to others. And even if our findings are what we expected or what we didn't expect, if there's a legitimate question that this is attempting to answer, other scientists then do what's called a peer review. A peer review is not what they call it today, right? They This is where you have other scientists that attempt to replicate your results, not people that look at whether or not you entered your shit right in your journal. And then when something gets to the point where not only has it been done, has it been tested, and has a result come out of it, and a conclusion been drawn due to that result, it's been replicated by multiple different individuals proving that it wasn't a fluke. Then we move from the world of hypothesis, educated guess, to theory. This is the best guess we have at the time. That's what a theory actually is. Very few things make the final journey to where they're codified as scientific law. In other words, it is not just accepted. It is 99.9999999 the case that this thing is what we say it is. And that's a very difficult journey uh, for a concept to make in the world of science, especially anything that we don't know yet, that we didn't know a couple decades ago, et cetera. Like the things that you can actually kind of codify into law are fairly self-evident to the point that once we developed this process, they kind of came out really quick. And that that's something that I think Again, I know that's really rudimentary. A lot of you are like, duh, Jack, I know all this. But we have to start there. 
Now, the thing is, you probably thought when you saw the title of what we were going to talk about today that I was going to talk about the jab or medications for uh, the disease that I shall not name to not get my uh, video demonetized on YouTube today. But I'm not. And or that I was going to talk about uh, some of the big shrieking. The science is settled subjects. I want to go much more broad than this, because I think this problem is something that until the recent events, you know, I didn't realize how big of a problem it was. I knew there were certain areas that were largely driven by money, where science was saying whatever the money behind it wanted the science to say. That if you were at an ag school and you were testing what the best way to grow crops was, and Monsanto, Conagra, Bear, et cetera, was funding your university, well, you were going to come out with results that were at least favorable to them. But I really believed that the individual scientist cared about the truth. I really believed that the scientific process was actually in place, that it was being manipulated, not that it had gone away. I think largely it's gone away. And it's not just the people with the money doing it. And I'm going to give you uh, five examples here in a moment. And I'll think it'd make it abundantly clear how widespread this is and then why it is such that the money can use the concept to manipulate a result. In other words, what I'm saying is there's a predisposition within science itself as a bureaucracy that, yes, money pushes the result they want out of it. But if you want to push a result through a system, then you have to understand the system and its flaws. And then you can leverage the flaws to get what you want. If you have a perfect system that works perfectly and does what it's supposed to do, then you won't really be able to get a result out of it other than the truthful result. You have to have a flawed system inherent to be able to buy influence in that system. If scientists actually practiced the basic fifth grade scientific method or the far more advanced method you should have learned in high school, right? If we actually did this, with, with kind of a feedback loop and a recheck, et cetera. If we did this, then money could come in like crazy. If the system was not flawed, you'd not get Monsanto buying a result. You'd not get big pharmaceutical companies being able to produce science that supposedly says, if you're taking a painkiller medication, but you actually have pain, you can't get addicted, which is exactly how they sold the opioid epidemic into America. That was, that was the story that was told by science. You can't, you see what I'm saying? Now, let, let's talk about this in some places that don't get talked about a lot, where this system of dogmatic, ingrained belief within the science community itself is the flaw that's exploited by the money. And this is what Jeffrey Pornell, God rest his soul, called the iron law of bureaucracy, that within any organization, you'll have people that are actually concerned about doing what the organization is supposed to do, and people concerned about the organization itself. And those concerned about the organization itself will be the bureaucracy. They'll be the bureaucrats. They'll be the administrators. They'll be the, in the words of uh, Bill Mollison, they'll be the politicians and the priests. And that because you have that group of people at the core of the organization, eventually all the people concerned about the mission will end up controlled by the small number of people in the administrative position because they control promotions, rules, policies, procedures. And eventually, the people on the outskirts, the, the rank and file, as they're often called in law enforcement, end up simply complying with the central authority because it's the only way to get advanced and keep your job. And that's exactly what's happened with science. And here's examples of it. That at least four of the five are just ones we don't really think about a lot. The first one is, in the world of ecology, natives are good. Introduced species are bad. So much so that this is how you know it's dogma. If you buck that at all, if you say anything at all to the counter, you get violently, and I mean verbally violently, violently attacked. People that have come out, Fred Pierce uh, wrote a book called The New Wild, and it, it breaks this down really well. I just learned about it from Jeff Lawton over the weekend, and I am going to, I, I'm already like halfway through. It's an amazing read, link to it in the video notes here uh, for you guys. And it, it really, I'm not going to go deep into each one of these issues. I just want to kind of give you like a surface level. It, it, it clearly explains how like all these catastrophic examples of, well, rats got on this island and ate all the birds that couldn't fly. Um, these are all in very brittle systems. And it doesn't take 
into account in a larger ecosystem, the non-brittle nature and how strength in diversity actually is a thing in nature. And the more diverse an ecosystem, the more stable an ecosystem. And it doesn't look at successes even on islands like Ascension Island, where um, basically plants from all over the world were planted. And this island was pretty much a barren rock, 99% of it. And now it has a beautiful cloud forest on it with all these plants that did not co-evolve. But if you bring that up, you're, you're violently attacked within science itself and certainly by the onlookers that go trust the science because everybody knows that inherently an introduced species must be bad. Despite the fact you can point to hundreds of introduced species in the United States that become naturalized and fit in. And then as Jeff put it in the video I was watching him talk about this in, well, you know, so animals get onto a log or seeds get onto a log and float down a river. They float out to sea. They drift in the air. They, they travel on the feet of a bird. Are you going to outlaw all of that? Where, where do we, where do we stop? Like, so people doing it is wrong, but nature doing it's okay. Does that actually make sense? And maybe in some places it does, maybe it doesn't, but this absolute hard line, this dogmatic belief inherently an introduced species must be bad has Tons of data that shows that that's not true. And yet, if you say it, you're attacked. Here's another one. The concept of human history itself. Anybody that's listened to the Joe Rogan interviews with Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson knows how ridiculous the dogmatic belief is that human history, we completely understand it. There's no need to look past 12,000 years in the past for civilization. There were no civilizations any older than that. That, that's a, that is the, the dogma in science to the point where we've actually found civilizations under the ocean. And everybody wants to start screaming that you're talking about a Star Trek Atlantis theory or something. No, we're just saying there's people, they lived here in this civilization, and the ocean existing where this civilization is now, that ocean wasn't there, or that ocean was already there 12,000 years ago. Ergo, nobody builds a civilization at the bottom of the ocean. Ergo, this civilization had to exist prior to this timeline where you say none exist. And the archaeologists who should be digging into this, who should be intrigued by this, say there's no reason to explore those ruins under the ocean because we know they won't teach us anything. That is, is inherently asinine. Um, next would be the belief that the only way to protect the environment is to exclude people from it. I just listened to a great podcast uh, done a while ago with Neil Spackman. Neil Spackman did an incredible project uh, over in Saudi Arabia, working with the Bedouins. And now he's kind of come back from there. It's years later. He's learned a ton. He's on his own. He went to business skill school and he's now set up a company and they are planting something like, I don't know the, the number of acres, but it's roughly the size of Manhattan where the project is. And include that includes waterways in Mexico where they're planting mangroves to enhance the number of species of fish and actually clean water that's being used for aquaculture now that's going into the oceans is polluting them and re, you know, kind of kick that back into a rebound loop and expand this. And by planting like, I think they want to plant something like 9 million mangroves, right? And, and, and fishing in Florida, I can tell you what mangroves do for an ecosystem. It is incredible what mangroves do for an ecosystem. And so he wants to do this and then you can employ people to fish and instead of so instead of the problem being there's there's too much fishing, the problem is we've overfished certain areas. And what we need are more fish, not less fishing. Since humans eat fish and fish are a natural resource, we should be cultivating wild fish in wild ecosystems as a positive influence on them using actual science to do that. But of course, the 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 accepted meme in ecology today and environmentalism is wherever humans go, there must be damage. And we have to make a, a, a false dichotomy again, that he, either you, you see the human's needs or you see to the earth's needs and one must inherently harm the other. This is dogmatic throughout all areas of environmentalism and science today, not just, you know, climate change or whatever. And, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a sickening thing. And you can't possibly assert that you're being scientific if you limit yourself to that dogmatic belief system. Here's another one. The concept that all illness is best treated with drugs. I mean, science will pay homage to things like, well, you know, when we found out what scurvy was, we gave people vitamin C and that terrible thing went away. 
Um, and there's some nutritional deficiencies, but since everybody, you know, eats ramen noodles today and that has all the goodness you need in it, don't worry about it anymore. And if you're sick in any way, shape or form, you know, we might even tacitly mention, you know, diet and exercise or whatever, but really you get sick, you get a drug and this drives everything in medicine today. It's, and it's, it's, it's ridiculous because if there was a disease, I don't know, some disease that maybe recently became a big thing for people. And you realize that not just on age, but across the board, the majority of people didn't really do poorly with it. And then some group of people did poorly, but were kind of okay. And then it hit some people really, really hard and killed them. If you were being scientific, the first thing you would say, well, yeah, it, it hits people that are 88 years old with three comorbidities harder. We, we, that's obvious. But if we have some 40-year-olds that are hit real hard by this illness, whatever it might be. I don't know. And uh, most 40-year-olds aren't. Wouldn't you think it'd be a good idea to just say, well, why don't we do a full nutritional blood panel? Look at vitamin D levels, look at every, you know, every vitamin and mineral and see, is there? There's no guarantee there will be, right? But wouldn't you say, wouldn't it make sense to see if there is some sort of glaring, obvious thing just using an empirical data and pulling the data and, and, and data raking it and saying, hey, look, you know, shit, if all these people are deficient in vitamin D that get really sick or the vast majority are, maybe we should look at that. Or if it's a selenium deficiency or a vitamin C, whatever it is. See, science seeks the truth. It doesn't seek to confirm a, a methodology. It doesn't seek to confirm a dogma. It seeks the truth. Next up would be... Um, the myopic view on climate change. This is the one everybody thinks you're talking about when you go into this world, but I'm going to put it a little bit differently than maybe you've ever heard it before. Let's say that people like me that say, sure, it's probably the case that CO2 in the atmosphere has at least some effect on global temperatures. And 1800s, you know, science teaches us that there's a limit to what that can be. We've exceeded that limit and it's not worth worrying about. Let's say I'm wrong. Let's say I'm I'm 100% wrong. And let's say the IEEE and the, the consensus, consensus of science is correct and that CO2 is as big a problem as they say it is. Again, I don't believe this, but let's say that it is. The myopic view that this is the thing we must concern ourselves with, that every single time we're looking for funding, it has to be about CO2. It has to be about this one thing. That myopic view take something as dynamic as the, as the global ecosystem. All the climate types, all the places, all the weather patterns, all the animals, all of the actions of human beings outside of burning fossil fuels. It takes all of it and it shoves it to the side and says, we know it's there, but it, it's not really that important. The only thing that matters is that your car gets more miles to the gallon or that you put solar panels on your roof or that you somehow sequester carbon. Now, I'm all for sequestering carbon. In fact, if you want to build healthy ecosystems, if you want to build really great pasture and civil pasture and savanna systems, if you want to build healthy mangrove systems, like I was talking about with Neil Spackman earlier, then you must sequester carbon. That carbon cycle is real. Those, th th those ecosystems need that carbon in soil for it to do its job for those ecosystems to thrive. But maybe we should be talking about making those ecosystems thrive. Maybe we should be asking a question when somebody says something like, but look at all this catastrophic shit that happened because rats got on this island. What did humans do to that island before the rats got there? Isn't that like, see, all of these things, they all go together. You have to be asking questions from every angle. And when we settle in on a single thing, it is absolutely the case that we're going to be at least partially wrong. And then I'll... I'll bring it to the concept that's in the thumbnail today. And let me pull this up real quick, just so that I can make sure that I say it correctly. This quote uh, by Jerry A. Corn. Uh, Religion is based on dogma and belief, whereas science is based on doubt and questioning. And you see, that's, that's my issue here. We have entered a world where we cannot have science. The way science has always been defended over beliefs, over articles of faith, is that since we, we have a faith and the book says a thing or a tradition says a thing, we are then required as an adherent to that faith to say, I believe, to profess belief in this thing. 
and to not question it. Maybe question how, but not question that. And science came along and said, this is not a way to make decisions that will impact all of humanity. This is not a way to decide whether or not to treat an illness a certain way. This is not a way to determine whether or not we should cut a tree down or not. This is not a way to figure out how to navigate to a place. Like the, 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 That's fine. That's the realm of religion. In the world of science, we will always question everything, and we will always doubt everything. And only when a thing that we question and doubt has enough evidence to support it, will we take it on as being factual. And where do we live today? We live in a world today where science is an authority akin to religion. And that you're wrong. You're a heretic for questioning science. And at that point, it's no longer science. And again, I had this misguided belief, this truly misguided belief that, oh, it was here and it was here. It was in these places, these hot button subjects that we've kind of dodged around today. You know, it's in big ag, it's in big pharma, it's in, you know, climate change, right, AGW. But surely the vast majority of scientists that are out actually doing science are not doing this, that this is just where the hooks of big business got in. In a word, depending on how you spell it, it could be one word or two, bullshit, bullshit. It's literally everywhere. And I figured out why. It does go back to that iron law bureaucracy, and it goes back to the more you have vested in a thing, the more you'll defend the thing, even if the thing is wrong. So you think about how the scientific community works today, as, as opposed to how it's supposed to work. The way it should work is anybody with an idea should be brought forward and say, present your findings, and let's figure this out. And I, even if I think you're wrong, let me examine what you've done. Let's, let's tear it apart. Let's not make this about opinion. Let's make this about data. That's how it's supposed to work, but it doesn't. What happens is a generation of scientists, as they get old enough to take over the positions of leadership, either adopt an old paradigm that's already existed, or they decide to finally move forward with a little bit of progress and take on a new one. And then they control everything. It's beyond just the administrators. It's the senior professors. It's the people that give out the grants. It's all of these people adopt this paradigm at about the same age cohort of about a 20-year gap in age at the point where they're at the peak of their authority. And it takes until the very last of them kind of ebb out of the system for that next group to take over and be able to determine whether or not there's going to be a new paradigm or not. And the older that person in that cohort of age group gets, and the longer they've been there, the more times they've signed off on a paper that says a thing, the more times they've stood in front of a lecture hall and claimed that they knew a thing that we don't know, that we just think. And because of that, they become vested in that story, vested in that narrative, vested, dare I say, in that belief system rather than a knowledge system. And they feel compelled to defend it. And then anybody that brings up anything that says, this might be wrong, is a threat to the order of science. It's a threat to the authority of science. It's a threat to something that should not exist within science. Science should not be an authority, and science should not have authorities. Recognized experts are not authorities. They're recognized experts. Recognized experts have been wrong often. And then you hear people when they say, well, I, we believe this now, or we believe that now. They'll say... It's okay that I changed my position, right? We know somebody who said that recently because the science changed. So I changed my position based on the science. Well, wait a minute. If science changes as we learn more, then why is it wrong to question science that you say is settled? You see how it doesn't make any sense? And this is why I do not trust science as an authority because it's not an authority. It is a process. And anybody that says otherwise, doesn't know the square root of F all about science. With that, I'm going to wrap up the podcast recording and say, yes, Galileo did face the same issue, Scott. You're correct. Every scientist – see, I'll put it to you this way. It's something I meant to get into what I just did and I didn't. There's never been a scientist who's changed a paradigm who was cheered on while he was doing it. Think about that. We've never had like a scientist come forward and say, where we're at is wrong or limited. 
and we need to evolve to this next level. And the other scientists said, gee, maybe he's right. I hope he's right. Let's see if we can help him prove it. And if we're wrong, we'll prove it wrong in attempting to prove it right. I mean, have you? has anybody here ever seen that? I haven't. I haven't. What I've seen is absolute violent opposition to any new idea. Somebody comes out, they propose a new idea, and they're immediately labeled. They're, they're, they're actually ad hominem attacked. I mentioned Randall Carlson and Graham Ham Hancock. If you look into the history of those men, not everything they've suggested has been proven true. But most of what they suggested has either now been accepted as true or at least probable. But over 25 years, the, the two of them were ruthlessly attacked, personally attacked. Because who is this guy? He's just a, he's just a journalist. He's just a writer. Well, he's doing the freaking job you guys won't do. Now, Carlson actually is a scientist, but um, uh, Graham Hancock is really a writer. And so he goes and he starts investigating all of this stuff about ancient civilization. And all he does is say, here's what's there. Here's what's unanswered. Here's the most logical thing that we can conclude based on what's there and is being not really denied, but simply ignored. And then you're going to attack the man instead of the argument. That's not science. And so what we've done is we've created a false god, a false idol that we call science. It looks nothing like science, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna break off here and finish up now. But um, unless anybody else has anything else for me, I'm not gonna scroll back through everything. So all caps is the way to make sure that I see you in the in the comments there. But we've entered this 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 world of basically I call it scientific idolatry, where we're gonna worship this thing because when you take an edict from a source is absolute and 100% and unquestionable. You've elevated it to the level of a deity. And whether you're religious or not, because if you're religious, that clearly has problems. But if you're not, it's still a problem. If you're an atheist, you're the most likely to do this, and you're the one that should be the least likely to do it, because you should know straight up that you're supposed to question a thing until it's conclusively proven, and somebody saying it's proven doesn't make it proven. Have you ever had a person tell you, I trust the science and said to them, anybody in the comments are, and said to them, okay, explain the science to me. And they look like this. They don't know what the science is. They just know that the TV or the website told them that it was true. They don't even know the theory that they're defending. They have no idea what it is. And it's, it, it's really sad. And anyway, we're going to wrap now. I appreciate everybody that tuned in to the live stream, and uh, we'll catch up with you tomorrow with another one.